unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Today, I want to take our reading from Hosea chapter 10, verses 12. The Bible says, So to yourselves in righteousness, so to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is the time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Ye have plowed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity, ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thine way, in the multitude of thy mighty men. And it says, Therefore shall a tumult arise among the people, and all thy fortresses shall be spoilt, etc., etc., etc. This is a time when God, through the prophet Hosea, is sending a message to the children of Israel. They had lived a life of constant rebellion, falling off and restoration, falling off and restoration. And we see that God's heart has not ceased or did not cease to reach out to Israel for their redemption. And by the way, some people should understand that that's the nature of God. That for as long as the earth remaineth, he will continue to pursue men until he gets as many as will give him the opportunity to receive him and accept his lordship. It's the heart of God, all right? He will not rest until all come in. It's the heart of God. And through time in history, when you see his relationship with the children of Israel, you see he has labored to bring them back and bring them back and bring them back. But in such a time when he's speaking in Hosea, there's an emphasis in verse 12 that I want to give us and through 13. In this instance, he brings a very fundamental appeal to the children of Israel. And that is that he's telling them to sow themselves in righteousness and reap in mercy. And because of that, he's asking them to break their fallow ground, all right, to break their fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness on them. And he tells them, of course, you had gone your own wicked ways and sowed your lives in iniquity. And because of that, you hid to lies. In the same time, you hid to the lies of men and went your own way and said to do things in your own strength and ability. But now he's calling them back. And he's saying, the only way I can restore you is that you sow yourselves in righteousness and reap mercies break your fallow ground it is time to seek the lord god brings a very powerful ingredient in our seeking of the lord not all who seek god find him and not because he does not want to be found by all men but in the seeking there are people who don't know how to seek the lord all right and when we're talking about that seeking we also define the place and positioning of the spirit in our seeking all right are we seeking to find a god who is away from us all right because i believe that when it comes to the new testament dispensation a new testament seeker is different from an old testament seeker an old testament seeker was a soul trying to relate with a god that was without a new testament seeker is a spirit that is connected already to God and the soul or mind that seeks understanding of what they are and who they already are in the God that they have received. Okay, And the reason why I emphasize that is because many times when we're defining the seeking in the New Testament dispensation, many people seek God in the New Testament dispensation as men who sought God in the Old. Our seeking in the New Testament of God is different from the seeking of God in the Old Testament dispensation. Although the whole pattern of prayer is availed to us to understand how and learn how to pray. Even in the New Testament, our prayer life, our way and patterns and principles of prayer are different from 
the prayer patterns principles of the Old Testament dispensation. Unfortunately, there's many people who have not known the difference, but in some of the teachings I've shared in the prayer codes and the rest, when you understand how to pray in the New Testament dispensation, you realize that it is different from how men used to pray in the Old Testament dispensation. For example, when David is praying to the Lord, he is asking God to create in him a clean heart. All right, and to renew a right spirit within him and to not cast him away from his presence and to restore unto him the joy of his salvation. In that dispensation, such a prayer was allowed. But you cannot pray or sing that kind of prayer in the New Testament dispensation because if you understand what Jesus Christ has done or what God has done through Christ, through his death and resurrection, you realize that certain prayers are not applicable in the New Testament dispensation. You cannot say, create in me a clean heart, because he prophesied in Ezekiel that I will create in them a new heart. I will give them a new heart, not a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh. Every new creation, the scriptures are clear, carries a heart of flesh, not of stone, right? So you cannot ask for a new heart. You already have a new heart when you become a new creation, all right? And then you cannot tell God, do not take your Holy Spirit from me because the Spirit of God cannot depart from the believer, all right? You were sealed with him, the Bible says. And because you were sealed with him is the guarantee of your redemption. There's a sealing between you and the Holy Spirit. When you became born again, you became one with God. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So you cannot pray such prayer. And so in such like things again, I try to bring this emphasis, okay, that when we are looking at the New Testament dispensation, the seeker of the New Testament dispensation is not the seeker like the one of the Old Testament dispensation. You must understand that. We don't seek to find a God. No, we have actually found that God, but we find or seek the understanding of the God that we already have in whom we live, move, and have our own being. I hope I'm clear on that. But in this understanding of what is already given to us, in the exercises of the spirit by which we are trained in, you know, to understand the things that are freely given unto us by the Holy Spirit, okay? Certain consciences are awakened and certain attitudes must be built by the church in understanding this or else men will not find God the way they're supposed to find him. And in this finding, I mean to understand God the way they're supposed to understand him. And we are in a season, we're in a period and a time of human history where the church people must know God more than ever before because it's evident in the world that evil and sin have increased. They vex the regenerated spirit. In fact, recently I was talking with someone and I told him, you know, now in this dispensation, we're even trying to define normal because many things and many people are walking out of normalcy. They are becoming abnormal every day in the way they do things, in the way they relate with things, in the way they react to phenomena. And so to keep that sanity, I believe more than ever before, the message of Christ must be clear. Beyond semantics and vocabulary, beyond good articulation, the lights and cameras, the word of God must be clearer and deeper than it has ever been before. But there's this conversation that I'm bringing for you in the breaking of the fallow ground, right? He's telling them your fallow ground must be broken. All right. And what is the meaning of a fallow ground? Fallow grounds are grounds that have been unsown into and ripped into and harvested into. They are grounds that are rested, bare, and unattended. All right. And either can be like that because they are not the kind in which anything can be sown into, or some are that kind because they have been rested after a long period of being sown into, and therefore they need to rest for some time so they can regain nutrients and life, so they can be replanted again. And some simply are fallow because they are both, you know, ready to be harvested, but these are not things that certain people have access to, okay? But when we get into the New Testament dispensation, this fallow ground becomes the heart. In Matthew 13, when God is expressing the facets of hearing, all right, and how a farmer goes to sow seed and some fall on stony ground and some on thorny ground and the like, when he gets to the 23rd verse, he speaks of he that receiveth the seed in the good ground, okay? And when he's talking about receiving the seed in the good ground, in this instance, the ground is the heart. All right? In this instance, the ground is the heart. And then he speaks of he that receiveth seed into a good ground. And the Bible says, it's that he that heareth the word and understandeth it. Underline the understanding again. And I'm going to emphasize some of those things as I continue. All right, Like I emphasized that the New Testament creation 
in the seeking of God is actually seeking the understanding of the things that are already given by Christ. All right? If somebody receives the seed into the good ground, which is the heart, and he heareth that word and understandeth it, the Bible says that person bears fruit. And when they bear fruit, the Bible says some bring forth 30-fold, 60 or 100. All right? Some bring 100, some bring 60, some bring 30 depending on how the man has understood this mystery. Now, let me also emphasize this, that when God speaks of the 100, the 60, the 30, all right, he's not talking about the times. When we're talking about folds, we're not talking about the times. There's no such thing, all right, as the times. Because remember, when we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, we're talking about love and the rest, okay? We're not talking about the times. How then do you calculate goodness? Does somebody receive back a reward of 30 times of good stuff or 60 times of good stuff or 100 times of good stuff? No. But the mysteries in the numbers, 30, 60, and 100. God has called you to a fullness. God has called you to bring out and demonstrate and manifest everything which is in you, which is in Christ. The church has not been called just to fulfillment, but to overflow individually and generally as a body of Christ. And if you're a student of the word, you'll see that the 30, 60, and 100 are dimensions, all right? And they carry a certain order of the spirit. For example, when you're talking about the dimension of the 30s, then you go and study the Hebrew and understand how the 30s are applicable. For example, why did Jesus Christ begin his ministry at the age of 30, John the Baptist, age of 30? There's a reason why this 30 comes through, all right? The graces of the 30, the dimension of the 30 really represents that introduction into the simplest learning of what it means to have divine authority, all right? The glory that comes with the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. That is in the dimension of the 30 folds, all right? So when we're talking about 30 fold, we're talking about that. We're talking about you understanding how to exercise God given authority and power that is given you, all right? When you go into the 60 fold, you learn the sustainability of things, how to keep stuff, you know? the underlying hand of God that sustains things. You understand what it means to be consistent in the spirit because we have people who demonstrate power, but they don't carry a consistency of the spirit. Today they are up, tomorrow they are down, today things are working, and tomorrow things are not working. But when we get into the hundredfold, we're talking about the fulfillment of all promises to the overflow, the place where you start setting paces even without much effort because the things that are coming out of you ooze impartations. You're not just a resource, you are a source in the spirit. And if you're a reader of church history, you realize that some men were resources, okay? People go to them to borrow. When they're stuck, when they're sick, they listen to their sermons. You know, when you're poor, they have a teaching on wealth. Some men are resources, all right? But some men are sources. Paul told Timothy, from whom thou hast learned these things, all right? To understand how certain people are sources because they bear an authority in the spirit that carries impartations into the lives and generations of men. And such men can affect ministries for the next 50, 60 years, hundreds of years, even when they're long gone. They can define, you know, the mannerisms, the way of the spirit the imitations of those that should come after them become clearer and clearer because to not imitate them is actually pride because God has set some men and women as books he has set them as precedences of many glories and graces and to understand that it takes a certain maturity of the spirit but we're still talking about the fallow ground okay we're talking about the state of the heart we're talking about the state of the heart that is why when we emphasize, and I always tell people, every time we emphasize, like the book of Proverbs says, to keep your heart with all diligence, all right? Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Some people don't understand that that is supposed to be a constant play in our spirits, all right? Keep thy heart with all diligence. It's supposed to be a constant flow of commitment in any mature person to keep it. It's not something you do once in a year. It's not something you do once in a lifetime. It is something that you constantly exercise yourself into. You know, that's why it says, keep thy heart with all diligence. It says, for out of it flow or are the issues of life. You learn to keep it constantly. This is not a one-off, oh, you know, I kept my heart 20 years ago. No, it is a constant life 
of exercising of the self of the spirit to keep a conscience void of offense toward God and man. Okay? But begin with God because you can only offend man all right, when you've not understood God. When you understand God, you cannot offend man. God is love. All right? And besides love, there is no law. All right? Because this revelation of love is the way it keeps you from error. Okay? And that's what Jesus left us. When we're talking about the commandments of the Christ, we're talking about the command of love. All right? Not the turn of Moses. No. In fact, it says when you understand how to walk the way of love, the Bible says you fulfill all commandments. All right? But I'm emphasizing something here. When it tells us to keep or to guard our hearts or to keep our hearts constantly for out of them flow the issues of life. And it's the thing that Hosea is trying to emphasize, that men should break, you know, the fallow ground. And he's talking about the heart, all right? The heart can be hardened. And once the heart is hardened, it cannot seek God, it cannot serve God, it cannot be used of God, all right? Now, when we're talking about fallow grounds, like I said at the start, there are kinds of fallow grounds. And a person who is not born again is a fallow ground in the sense that the word of God has not yet entered their heart. All right? So they have a hardness of heart and a stiff-necked nature because they are not yet born again. All right? And so sometimes when we're talking about the breaking of fallow grounds, when we're going into the realm of the men of this world, we're talking about the word that has to be deposited in their heart through faith, and then they receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. All right? But when we get into salvation, our life and walk of faith, I have also seen people who also have a sort of fallow ground, a hardness of heart. And the hardness of heart in the New Testament dispensation only comes through ignorance, not nature. Ignorance, not nature. Because when you're born of God, you're born into the obedience of the Spirit. You're born into a certain place of sanctification. Peter speaks about that. You know, the sprinkling of the blood and the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience. So if there's any sort of disobedience in the New Testament creation, it is really to the degree of ignorance in that creature, right? You can say, but he knows what he's doing. No, 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 no. No one which is born of God can deliberately, habitually, intentionally commit sin. No. Because the Bible says the divine sperm abides in that person. He cannot. No person who is really born again can just wake up and deliberately say, I'm going to do this. It might look like they're deliberate, but I tell you, they cannot be deliberate. Because, see, he tells us that they are not just born of corruptible, but they are born of the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God and liveth and abideth forever. All right? So, because they are born of an incorruptible seed, it's in their spirit to do right. That's why Paul says the spirit in Romans 7 is willing. The spirit is always willing to do right. When they go the way of the flesh, they know that they've gone wrong. No man who is really born again needs to be told that they have sinned. They always know that they have sinned. But in the place where you struggle, in the life in which you live, it only represents a place in which you are ignorant of God's grace, his power, and mercy over you in that area. And as you continue to know the truth, the Bible says the truth makes you free. Okay, the truth makes you free. That is why we constantly give truths to people. Because as people continue to understand who they are, to understand what they have in Christ, okay? A lady years ago came to me and told me, oh, I'm struggling, my body cannot control itself. I find myself doing this and that. I mess up my body. And I remember I shared with her, I told her, do you know that you are the righteousness of God in Christ? And I took time just to explain what that righteousness represented. And in a couple of months, she was free from the weakness of the flesh. It was an ignorant issue. It wasn't simply a deliberate mind made up to, you know, wrong God or go against God's precepts. Okay? So ignorance is a very powerful thing when you think about it. Because it clogs the revelation of this glorious light that should bring deliverance. Remember, it is the light that shines in darkness, and that darkness cannot comprehend it, all right? Where there is no light, there is comprehension. Where there is light, there is no comprehension. Darkness cannot hold back light, all right? And the light 
is in the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the expression of his person to mankind through giving us the word, that word that comes with divine love and his purpose for our redemption. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, let's go back to what I was sharing. He says, you learn to keep your heart. Okay? Now, in the New Testament, it said that that sometimes comes through ignorance. Many people are ignorant of how God works. All right? And so the afflictions we see in the body of Christ are because many people are ignorant. They do not know what to do, when to do, and how to do it. All right? The reason why you who is watching me suffering financially is because you are ignorant of something. There is something you are ignorant about. The reason why you're sick, there's some you don't know, or perhaps you claim to know, but you do not know. But when you know the truth, and I emphasize that, the truth will make you free. There are things I've told people personally, if I struggle with something and I see something is not moving the way I should, I usually go to God and ask him, what am I missing? And he's always generous enough to tell me, you know, this is why you're missing it, because he gives wisdom to whoever asks liberally, all right? He abradeth not, okay? And so when I understand, oh, this is how I'm supposed to do this, then I exercise myself in the instruction of the Lord. And once that truth comes, it is there to make me free. That is the power of revelation knowledge, all right? I can never emphasize enough the power of the mystery of revelation, all right? Now, let's go back to Hosea. He said, sow yourselves in righteousness, and you shall reap in mercy, all right? And when you reap in mercy, he's saying the only way you can do that is to break the fallow ground. In other words, allow your heart to be broken to the reality of the seed of righteousness, Hallelujah. And when you learn how to break to the seed of righteousness, you will reap mercy. All right? And when you reap mercy, now you are starting to seek God. You're starting to understand God. All right? You're starting to understand God. You cannot know God if you do not know how to sow yourself in righteousness. You cannot know God. You cannot know God. When Paul is talking about the fellowship, the sufferings of the Christ, to experience the resurrected power of Christ, to be conformed to him, he emphasizes the place of being found in him, not having his own righteousness, which is of the law, right? But which is of the faith of Christ Jesus, the righteousness, he says, which is of God by faith. And that I may know him, Paul says. The next verse says, that I may know him, all right, and the power of his resurrection. You cannot know God when you've not understood the righteousness which is of God through faith. You cannot know God when you have not understood the righteousness which is of God through faith. That is why he says, that I may know him. The next line, Philippians 3.10, that I may know him. But how do you know him? Firstly, you have to be found in him, in verse 9, not having your own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, even the righteousness of God by faith. If you don't understand that, verse 9, you cannot know God. Nobody would or should claim to know God fully when you have not understood the righteousness of God through faith, which comes by the faith of Christ. If you have not understood that, that is why in the 13th verse of Hosea 10, right, Hosea chapter 10, he says, because they have plowed wickedness. How? They have ripped iniquity. How? He says, they have eaten the fruit of lies. Deception is the mother of all iniquity. Deception is the mother of all wickedness. And why? Because they trusted in their way, not in the way of God, and in the multitude of their mighty men, and not in the way of God. So they looked without in the might of men, in their own ways as individuals, and they listened to the spirit of deception. And that then led them astray into wickedness and iniquity. And God is calling them back to tell them, look, sow yourselves in righteousness. 
sow yourselves in righteousness and reap mercy. All right? When you do, okay, he says, then it's obvious that you've started to seek God because you're breaking the fallow ground. Here, he's dealing with the heart of man to embrace the righteousness of God, to sow themselves in the righteousness of of God to reap the mercies of God he says because that is the only way the heart can be broken when the heart is broken when the fallow ground is broken all right then men will seek God now the line says until he says God rains righteousness on us okay now for the old testament it was not yet given or imputed in the new testament we cannot say we're seeking you God until you impute righteousness on us no. In fact, if you read that verse from the Amplified Version, it says, Sow yourselves according to the righteousness, the uprightness, and right standing with God. And it says, Reap according to mercy and loving kindness. And it says, Break up your uncultivated ground, which is your heart, for it is time to seek the Lord, to inquire for and of him, and to require his favor. All right? The Bible says, Until he comes and teaches you righteousness and rains his righteous gift of salvation upon you. Now, we cannot say that we're going to seek God until that gift of righteousness comes upon us through salvation. We and you, you and I who are watching, hopefully, are born again. And if you're born again, then we cannot say that you're going to seek God until he pours that on you. The Old Testament used to seek that. Now, you are in the realm where you carry that righteousness imputed on you by faith. All right? And because it is imputed on you by faith, the only way your ground can be fallow is if you set yourself against understanding the realities of the New Testament dispensation. When we're talking about the righteousness imputed by faith, when we're talking about the grace message, we're not just talking about the doctrine simply that imputes righteousness on you and then, you know, makes you live a good life. No, this thing is deep. It is deep. It is so deep. And I believe that those of you who are following me from the beginning now connect to what I'm saying. So when you hear people excited about the grace message, some people think the grace message is just in the excitement of the fact that God does not impute sin on you but righteousness. And some even further misrepresent the message. And these ministers, God's ministers, that we say that people should continue doing good or doing whatever they want because their spirits are free so good may come. That is damnation. Jesus did not come and shed his blood for us to live irresponsibly. In fact, on the contrary, nobody born of God can deliberately live that life. All right? But I know and I suspect why the proponents of that kind of idea would do that. It's old. In Romans 3.8, Paul was accused of the same. It's the same spirit that worked on the men that sat under Paul, still works on some people in present day. And it makes them close their hearts from the reality of the truth. And some of those people, if you study them, it's the ignorance we're talking about, you know. It is what hardens their hearts, all right. It's what makes their ground follow. They cannot connect to what God is trying to do in us through faith. They cannot understand it. In Galatians, he tells us to learn to sow to the Spirit. He says that if you sow to the flesh... You shall surely die. You'll surely die. But he says, but if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life or life eternal. All right? Now, if you connect to Hosea 10, 12, he told you, sow yourselves in righteousness and reap mercy. Okay? In Galatians, he says, if you sow to the flesh, you shall surely die. All right? You will surely die. You'll die. You'll reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, he says, you will reap life everlasting, life eternal. All right? Now, this is one of the most fundamental ways of sowing to the Spirit. You cannot sow to the Spirit when you have not been calibrated in the message, aligned in the truth. You have to understand the New Testament and what it represents. Every day, I think I've understood and I'm shocked again at how much more God pours in my spirit concerning righteousness by faith, concerning the grace of God. Because even when we think we have understood it, God brings more and floods it in our spirits. So he will allow us to share with the world. 
And the deeper we launch in God, the more aligned we are to his will. Because remember, the kingdom you're dealing with is a kingdom of glass. Okay? And as we behold, like in a mirror, we are changed. But if the image in the mirror becomes blur because we are veiled, okay, because we are veiled, then it means we walk on in darkness. Our foundations are out of course. Yes, we are gods, but we die like mere men. You don't leave the fullness of what God has ordained for you. And today, the Bible says, every time Moses is read, that veil covers their face. Because in Christ, not just by, but in Christ, the Bible says the veil is dealt away with. The veil is dealt away with. Right? So, the reason why Jesus Christ is in your heart is that you will observe with unveiled face is that you will see the image as it truly is. Christ is the express image of the invisible God. The kingdom of glass has to express a certain vision, a certain image. And that image is the person of Christ. So when he puts that mirror before you, he's actually telling you, behold Christ fully. And as we continue to behold Christ fully, so you become as he is. As he is. So as we continue to teach, we are casting the image of the person of Jesus Christ. Paul says we preach not ourselves, but him crucified. Okay? The reason why we express Christ and teach Christ to you and not us, and that we must decrease and he must increase, is that at the end of the day, when you carry the full image of this Christ, as is given by this mirror, by this glass, the change is inevitable. In fact, we teach wrong to tell men to change. No man has the ability to change themselves. No man has the ability to change themselves. They can only change themselves by some spirit, by the power of God. Like the children of this world and the children of disobedience are acting according to the power of the spirit of this world, the prince of the air, Satan. All right? So you give this message, you preach Christ, and as people carry that expression of the Christ, the Bible says we are changed. And all of us with unveiled faces, the Amplified Version says that, and all of us, when we behold this unveiled face, because we continue, he says, to behold in the word of God. He says, because we continue to behold in the word of God, as in a mirror. He says, the glory of the Lord, we are constantly transfigured. We are constantly changed into his very image in an ever-increasing splendor from one degree of glory to another degree. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So he says, as you continue to behold the word, but you see, it depends on what word you're beholding, all right? It depends on what doctrine you are ascribing to. It depends on what revelation, what message comes to you. But he says, if you receive the truth, all right, you don't need to change. No. It changes you. It changes you. The truth changes you. As you behold Christ, you are metamorphosed. You come from one level and stage of anointing of glory to another level of stage of anointing of glory because understanding comes to you. You come to the end of things and understand that all things have been given you by Christ. And only that understanding is exposing you to how much is already available for you in Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, when the Bible says, sow yourself in righteousness, right? Seed, harvest, reap mercy, right? Break the fallow ground. In other words, soften your heart and understand this sacred revelation. Because it's the only way you can seek God in truth. And that seeking is in the fullness of this understanding. Paul he says, I can only know him through this understanding. So when we emphasize righteousness by faith in Christ, it is bigger than just a doctrine. Okay? Oh, I've understood it. Why is it then that you don't have the results and the fruit of what you claim you have understood? I always challenge people, especially believers, that you will never, should never claim to understand what you cannot demonstrate or live out. You cannot. When you think you have, but you cannot demonstrate or live out or show forth, then you are deluded. You are deceived. You are deceived. And that's a sort of pride. Okay? 
because you claim to know what you really do not know and neither can you open your ground, your heart, to break, to actually know and yet you don't have the results of what you claim to know. And there are people who are so hardened that they can never learn anything. They think they know it all. Yet there are things on you that show that you actually don't have the understanding of what you claim to know. I have always been an admirer of people who can produce the results of the stuff they claim. If you say God is a healer, heal. If you say that God is rich, you better be. If you say that God delivers, you better be free. Because you cannot continue teaching of a freedom that you yourself cannot or have not walked into. That is feigned faith, the faith that deceives the self. When you minister in that realm, it means that people will look at you as a false one, even though you're speaking the right words. You can speak the right words all you want, but if they're not established in a certain understanding, you carry no authority to speak in the spirit realm. Remember, the spirit realm is commanded by people. And every dimension of the spirit responds to dimensions of knowledge and revelation. All right? Sons of Sceva come and they think, oh, they can rebuke devils by whom, you know, the apostles preach. And, the, you know, the spirit tells them, look, Jesus I know. He's transcended these realms. We know his authority in the spirit. Paul, we know. But who are you? Who are you? You understand? And what happens? The spirits destroyed them. But they use the name Jesus. It's not just enough to claim the name of Jesus. It takes a certain responsibility to know exactly what we're talking about. All right? Some people have hardened themselves against this reality of the righteousness of faith by Christ. But also, some people have failed to keep their heart diligently to that course. The bigger cluster of those that have actually understood the message of grace are people who have failed to be committed, to be consistent in the revelation of what they already know. Stuff comes and throws them off balance. And then they have to go back like people rewinding to replay the same story. And that's regression. That's backward movement. It's not forward movement. That is why some of you seem like you are in one place, even though they are you know, successes here and there, but you are really not moving. You are moving backward and then front and then backward and then front and then backward and then front and then backward. And if you continue like that, how far are you going to go? So he's telling you, keep your heart diligently. Why is he emphasizing the diligence of this? Because it is easy, even with the understanding of righteousness imputed by faith for Satan to throw you off that balance and take you back to the law without even knowing it. It is easy. It is so easy. But to exercise yourself in that reality, right? To exercise yourself in that reality, to go simply beyond I know to the place of being established, all right? He says somewhere in uh, Hebrews 13 verse 9, read the Amplified Version. He says, Be not carried about by different and varied and alien teachings. Be careful. Be careful with the teachings you hear. All right? Be careful. I tell people, as you continue to grow, your teachers reduce. Your teachers reduce. And it's not pride, no. But as you continue to understand, you are open to just how much is not spoken than is spoken. And sometimes the reality of truth is in so much that is not spoken. Because that's where God bases to tell you this is your part in the revelation. All right? So if somebody can actually take me deep and provoke my spirit to the unseen, then that is a teacher. Okay? But when you're a babe, anyone can instruct you. When you're growing up, anyone can instruct you. Everyone can teach you. All right? There are people who don't know the difference. I've heard, I've been around people who are comparing preachers. And they say, oh, this preacher's preachers like they're the preacher. <laughs> In my heart, I laugh. And I'm thinking, but these are two different ministers. But I know that this is a babe. They've not yet known, okay, the difference between the two ministers or the three or the four. Because they are probably comparing this minister with the other minister in one sermon or two sermons. Or because probably the other one talked about fish in their sermon and this one also talked about fish. Or probably they used the same examples. I say, huh, I think these people preach the same. No, no. It goes deeper than just preaching a similar sermon. 
All right? Not all the preachers who preach grace actually understand the message. I have been around people who know how to split it. And they can give you the message of grace and you're like, wow. But you look at their lives and you're like, hmm. This is preaching something he or she actually does not fully apprehend in the spirit. Because they are speaking a message of whose authority they do not carry. The dimensions of the spirit expose them. They are weighed and found wanting. The writing is clear on the wall. All right? It doesn't matter how much we seek to articulate and speak. There are weights that hold us accountable in the spirit concerning the things we claim to know. All right? And in that kind of place, it's easy for God to actually clearly express that and tell you, look, it doesn't matter how much you claim to know or teach. These are areas you need to exercise yourself into. But is your heart broken? Is your ground good enough to receive the word of God in humility and allow God to deal with you and change you within to without? Right? Because I've seen people who, you know, they speak against the message of grace and the ministers of grace, even without understanding what these people are for. Some say, oh, I don't believe in that minister. And you ask them, have you really ever listened to them? Uh, no, maybe as someone, but have you ever taken time to really listen to them? No, but they carry the fruit of the stuff you yourself actually admire, but you cannot have, and your heart, your ground is so hardened to respond to God to be broken, all right? But the end... I always tell people, time proves all contentions. You know, it always proves all contentions. Yeah? Time always proves it. You just give certain things time, certain individuals time. Then you study and see. And you see they cannot bring forth the fruit. Because if you have begun this from the beginning, I am teaching you how to bear fruit that remaineth. From the 30 to the 6 to the 100 fold. Because the end of every believer, if you don't understand this, how will you be consistent in the rest of the stuff when you've not understood the consistency of the primary things of the spirit. And God is saying that doctrine of righteousness is a primary thing. It is one of those things that must be consistently followed, diligently kept in your heart. Diligently kept in your heart. In other words, you should never let the devil, regardless of what you have done or been through, you should never let the devil convince you or even suggest to you to even consider for a moment that you are short of God's favor, God's love, and grace if you believe that the righteousness of God was imputed on you through faith. Some of you, you have made one mistake in life. I've had people who have made a mistake, and sad you made mistakes. Right? But out of that mistake, somebody says, I don't think God will ever hear me again. You have exposed your heart to destruction. Remember the Bible is very clear. That nothing from without entering a man defileth him. Because it entereth not in his heart. Right? That means the things that defile us are the things that enter into our hearts. The people right now watching me. Yes, you have understood the message of grace and stuff. But you still carry condemnation. You still carry guilt in your spirit. You still judge yourself. Even when you know that God has imputed righteousness on you you still think that you don't deserve certain things oh i messed up in this marriage i don't think god will ever rebuild me again because you messed up once oh my relationship died i don't think i'll ever find anything good oh i did this and i don't think i'll ever have that oh i messed up this job i don't no 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 listen if god was not a god of second and third and fourth and fifth chances I tell you, the Bible says, would all have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. Even the holiest man you know that exists in the face of the earth has sinned and come short of the glory of God. The only place of his vindication is the justification that we have through Christ. Through Christ Jesus. And some people, yes, you're fighting devils of generational curses and all these things. But I tell people, fight this fight of faith to continue believing in spite of it all that the righteousness of God is imputed on you through faith. All right? So he warns us and he says, uh -uh, take heed of diverse myths and mixing up yourselves in varied and alien teachings. You know, strange teachings. 
Because you have people who listen to everything. You're blessed today, they say amen. You're cursed today, then they say amen. You have this on you, they say amen. You don't have this on you, they say amen. They don't know how to keep diligently their spirits. Now, I'm not just talking about you understanding the righteousness imputed by faith or the grace of God. I'm trying to help you understand that you need to be diligently fixed and consistent and established in it that nothing wavers you off that course. Because many believers, even after understanding this message, you have failed to demonstrate the reality of grace and righteousness imputed, the reality of the law of liberty and the freedoms of the Spirit. So people are asking themselves, if you know the right message, why isn't it consistently demonstrated in your life? It's because you have not come to the full understanding of how to be diligently keeping in this course. All right? So he tells you, do not give yourself to different and alien teachings. For he says, it is good for the heart to be established. It is good for the heart to be established and ennobled and strengthened by means of grace. That's God's favor and spiritual blessing. And not to be devoted to foods, rules of diet and ritualistic meals, all right, which bring no spiritual benefit or profit to those that observe them. Oh, did you hear that? That when you heed to certain things, some foods and ritualistic tendencies that are not aligned to truth, the Bible says the proof of that is that you will not profit even as you observe these things. Okay, You'll be the Christian that goes to church every Sunday, every year, two years, three years, but you don't have the results of somebody who has been taught of God. And we are saying that it is also happening to people who have understood the New Testament dispensation, who they are in Christ, the righteousness imputed by faith, and the grace of God that is available to favor them and bless them, but they are not consistent in the doing because Satan has learned the art of planting certain things in their lives that sort of cause them to forget who they are, and then they backslide back. They need a sermon to restore them. But if you fix your mark and your heart to that diligence, to keep your heart, never to allow, regardless, I have told myself, I convince myself every day, I guard myself in this truth daily, that nothing in the world I can or will ever do that will disconnect me from the love of God, which is expressed in Christ Jesus. And because that love is an ever-fixed mark in my spirit, I know that the righteousness imputed on me is by faith and faith alone, and that's how I'm going to keep walking my course. I will make mistakes that I know in the flesh. I have made mistakes that I know in the flesh. But those things, whether things present or things to come, whether angels or principalities, he says no depth, no height, Nothing, he said, shall ever be able to separate me from the love of God which he has expressed in the person of Jesus Christ. That I am constant. Jesus loves me now like he loved me then. And there is nothing any man will ever do or say to change that in my spirit. There is nothing I even could ever do that could cause him to love me less. That one I'm persuaded but do you know that's the exact thing Satan is against in the doctrine of grace? Because when you teach that, the legal man will say, oh, so does that mean? It's not what you've said, but the man of the legal teaching will say, does that mean, therefore, that I can do anything I want because the love of God will never leave me or his righteousness will never depart from me or his grace is ever steadfast? And I asked this man and asked him, do you think that that's what I actually meant or that God provided for that in Scripture for us to continue to sin? The problem is not what God is teaching. The problem is how your heart receives it because the Bible says to the pure, all things are pure. And to the defiled and unbelieving, the Bible says nothing is pure because their conscience is defiled. Not because the man has taught a different message, but because their conscience is defiled. What is my message to you? Break your fallow ground. Soften your heart to the righteousness imputed by faith and the grace of God that is available to favor you and bless you constantly. Wake up every morning, regardless of what has happened in your life. Wake up every morning, regardless of what you've done and haven't done. 
Wake up every morning constantly assured in your spirit that God loves you. He has imputed righteousness on you. And that he's working in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And if there's stuff for him to deal in your life, believe his dealing. But as he's dealing, he's promoting you. As he's dealing, he's increasing you. As he's dealing, he's upholding you. When you maintain that kind of conscience or attitude, you will realize that even your moral life will become better every other day. You walk out of addictions without struggle because you are yielded to God to help you. You'll walk out of struggles. You'll walk out of tumults. You'll walk out of pains, distress, sickness. You'll walk out of that easily, seamlessly. Things will happen effortlessly for you. And as you continue to fix your mind on him, for the Bible says he's held in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. For the Bible says, for he doth trust in thee. The only way to prove to God that you trust in him, fix your eyes on Christ, the image is there in the mirror. Why don't you constantly behold him? What condemnation and guilt does is it takes your eyes from that mirror to look into the self. And every time you look into yourself, you dull up. You become dull. You die inside. You start reaping corruption. He says, sow yourselves in righteousness. You shall reap mercy. No judgment and condemnation. All right? Break your fellow ground. Allow your heart to receive the righteousness of God that is given through faith. All right? And as you continue to embrace that, the Bible says, now you are seeking God. Now you will know God. You will understand God. Because if you don't understand the first part of this, it doesn't matter how many times you'll open the Bible. It will never open up itself to you. Yet there are people in this world to whom the scriptures are opened. And I thank God that as I'm sharing right now, the word of God is becoming clearer to your spirit more than ever before. And that your heart is broken. The fallow ground is ready for the good word of God, the seed to come into. And out of you, I see 30, 60, and 100 fold blessing. You learn to bear fruit. Through the doctrine of righteousness imputed by faith, his mercies that are new every morning and the grace, the message in the person of Jesus Christ expressed in his love, unconditional love toward mankind and that ever constant intention to bless, to favor you, to uphold you, to lift you, to deliver you, to change you from within to without. And I thank God because that word is working in you. And as you understand it, you bear fruit that remaineth. Your end will be good. Your end will be good. In the mighty name of Jesus, I rebuke every spirit of condemnation, every stain of guilt. And in that place, I speak love. The love that covers a multitude of sins. The love that constrains you. But above all, like Corinthians 13, 8 says, the love that keeps you from falling, that never fails to change you. For he says, agape never fails. The faith of God that worketh through that same love is working in your life to have results, to have answers. To have a testimony. To be a solution. Just receive it right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Look and leave. Look to Jesus and leave. That's the one with whom you have a strong and perfect plea. He's your priest. I thank you Lord. Because your word goes out with power. And produces the results for which you send it. In Jesus mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you have never given your life to Christ, I want to give you a great opportunity to receive him as your personal Lord and Savior. I mean, how would you live without him? How? How? Not next week, not next year, now. I want you to receive. He wills that no man 
dies. He does not intend for you to perish. You have an option of a God who gave his life for you and shed his blood that you might be free. Receive him now and let him handle the rest. Don't even think about it first. Or th no, no. Just make up your mind now because you need him now than ever before. Repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you because you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Today, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. The message you Amen. have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.